I burned down the shoe tree of Mitchell, Oregon. And I'm not sorry I did it either. For those of you not in the know, tying the laces of a pair of shoes together and thrusting them into the branches of a shoe tree is a strange Oregonian ritual. It's rumored to have started with members of the military who would celebrate the end of their training by decorating a nearby tree with their used shoes. Yeah, I don't get it either. I don't think most people here understand why, but it's something we do. There are several famous shoe trees in the state. Juntura, Alfalfa, Bend, the list goes on. Nowadays, most shoe throwers do so to commemorate special events or to remember the death of a loved one. Graduate high school? Throw your shoes. Getting married? Toss them up there. Want to honor a lost family member? Throw those shoes. Moving? Yeah, you know what to do. Reflecting back on this now, I can't help but wonder how many of these people were unable to do whatever led them to visit a shoe tree in the first place. I'm left to wonder just how many lives have been lost to these seemingly harmless traditions. There's no shortage of missing and murdered people in the Pacific Northwest. Most people blame this on an unusually high concentration of serial killers. The I-5 killer, Dayton Laurie Rogers, Jerry Burdos, Gary Ridgway, Wesley Allen Dodd, Ted Bundy, etc. While I certainly recognize the terrible crimes these individuals have committed, I know for a fact that the Oregon shoe tree contributes to the amount of missing people in the area. I must admit, I used to be a blissfully ignorant Oregonian myself, and yeah, I've thrown my fair pair of shoes through the years, and I, I tossed my tattered pair of high tops into the branches of a shoe tree when I completed high school. A pair of black Oxford heels when my sister passed away. A set of tennis shoes when I started my career. All three pairs of shoes, and another important pair of shoes, not mine, rested in the branches of the Mitchell shoe tree. That is... Until I burned it down. My abhorrence for shoe trees commenced about six years ago. I was out taking a drive with my girlfriend one evening. It was our anniversary, and I had something special planned. After about an hour of seemingly pointless driving, I pulled off the road on the highway. She expressed confusion on the hiatus of our trip before I kissed her and revealed a small black box. I popped it open to show the ring. Didn't even have time to ask before she said yes. It was the happiest moment of my life. I had taken her to the Mitchell shoe tree to honor the moment of our engagement. I revealed a sharpie which my girlfriend, now fiancé, immediately snatched from my hand. She propped open one foot on her knee and scrawled some writing about the rubber side of her shoe. She showed off her work. We are engaged. I beamed as she exited the car, too excited to wait for me as I wrote the same on my own shoe. By the time I caught up with her, she was already standing before the tree, bending down to untie and loosen her laces. The next few moments played out like a horrific film in my mind, over and over again in slow motion. The tree swiftly unearthed several of its strongest roots, tearing the shoes from her body as she howled in pain. The tree passed the shoes upward into itself, each tier of branches accepting and passing the shoes up to the next tier like an endless system of arms until they lay near the top. The thick roots come down again, hard as my fiancé cries for help, but I can't move. I'm frozen in place, rooted like, like, a, like a damn tree. <laughs> I watch helplessly as the roots rip her apart, tear her bones popping out of their sockets, her flesh shredded off bone. She, she makes a, a sickening, gurgling sound as the tree compacts her into the earth, her body crumpling and folding in on itself until she vanishes into the ground. The tree repositions its roots under the dirt and settles as the night falls silent. It wasn't until I returned the next day that I realized that the tree had ripped her feet clean off with ragged scraps of skin dangling from the shoes and the, and the white of bone clearly visible in the morning light. If you look closely, you can see skeletal fragments in some of the other shoes. On each of the trees, not just the one in Mitchell. If you're finding this hard to believe, I understand. See, I, I wouldn't have believed it unless I saw it myself. However, we can all agree on the fact that the trees are at the very least living organisms, and if you've ever been alone in the Oregon woods at night, you know that trees are more than just that. The forest, they just, they come alive around you. You get the feeling that you're being watched, because you are. The trees are they're older than us. They're wiser than us. 
Old folklore describes the spirit of the trees as maternal and protective. That might have been true in the past. But humans as a species have done nothing but degrade nature in recent history. We chop trees down for our own selfish needs. We litter. We pollute the air and water all in the name of progress. To put it simply, trees, trees are tired of our shit. And throwing our ratty shoes onto their tired branches is just adding insult to injury. Exacerbating the fury of these once gentle giants. What really puzzled me, though, was why the Mitchell tree had taken her and not me. I mean, after all, I'd been safely performing this stupid ritual three times myself. I racked my brain for days before I realized that I had only thrown my shoes during the light of day. And I can only assume that the tree wouldn't act unless I was under the cover of nightfall. Perhaps as an act of self-preservation. This theory would become a crucial part of my plan to eliminate the shoe trees. I started with more conservative measures. I figured that if I could get people to stop using the shoe trees, the problem would be eliminated altogether. A flashback to the trauma I'd endured at the Mitchell tree kept me from returning there, so, so I approached another shoe tree in the early morning hours one day in early May of 2015. It took hours and a lot of work, but I removed every single pair of shoes from that tree. I was dismayed to discover that at least ten pairs of shoes contained skeletal remains. Okay, I even made the news. Some of the local residents were upset, while others were pleased with my efforts, but it's fair to say that all were confused. I was never tied to the event, with some speculating that a volunteer cleaned up the organization and stripped the trees of its shoes. And much to my dismay, people started throwing shoes again almost instantly. Following this development, I understood simply, simply deterring people would not be enough. In the past, shoe trees had blown over in storms and even burned down. Shenico specifically. But locals always just select another tree and start it all over again. I technically could try to explain the danger of shoe trees, but, but who would listen to the lunatic raving on about killer trees? It, it seemed the only way to get them to stop was to destroy every shoe tree in the state. I had to make a statement. I had to, I had to burn down the Mitchell shoe tree. It was the largest of them all. Admittedly, it took me an awful long time to gather the courage to actually do it. I spent years working through my trauma. The anniversary of my fiancé's death rapidly approaching, I decided to burn it earlier this week. I bought out all the local thrift shops for their cheapest old shoes. The ones that looked like they'd burn. I gathered all the materials that I had meticulously picked to assist me in my pursuit. There was no way I was going to go back at night. But I certainly didn't want to be caught. I settled for the early morning hours again, at the first sign of light. I packed up my Subaru and I set off on a route that I hadn't driven in six years. Highway 26, north of the Mitchell Shoe Tree. As planned, it was dark when I arrived a couple miles down the road. Lying in the back of the vehicle, I, I cried for some time. I finally collected myself enough to finish my preparations before daybreak. I stepped out of my car and just stood there for a moment. My feet glued. I figured it was... It was an hour never. So I popped my trunk and I retrieved my duffel bag before initiating my trek to the turnout. The tree was... Colossal. Menacing. In a way that had never appeared to me in my youth. But I swallowed my apprehension and I set to work. I locked my eyes on the behemoth of a tree and I unzipped the duffel bag. There were no signs of movement. I pulled the first pair of shoes already tied together at the laces from the sack and hurled it up into the tangle of branches. I jumped, startled, as a bird departed from the top of the tree. I called loudly. I continued hurling shoes, landing pairs in each of its levels. The tree remained motionless throughout, and I almost felt stupid at this point. I was at the last pair of shoes, the pair I was wearing. The one from the night of my engagement. I slipped them off, I tied them together before hanging them onto my forearm. The shoes swayed pendulously as I retrieved a pack of American spirits from my backpack. And I plucked a cigarette from a carton. 
I lit up and I took a few slow drags, relishing what I was sure were my last few moments before an agonizing death. The tree finally betrayed its stillness when I pulled several matches from my pocket, laughing suddenly and hysterically. The roots rapidly unearthed as I slipped the still-lit cigarette into a rubber band that I'd wrapped around the bundle of matches. And then the roots were on me, and there was only searing pain. The tree latched onto my now bare feet, crushing them with formidable strength. It took every ounce of mental energy I still possessed to recall the next step in my plot. Put matches in shoes, I thought, and I obeyed my own internal directions. The roots compressed even more firmly on my feet, and I felt my bones break and grind together as I wailed in agony. The tree's severe grip, while torturous beyond belief, kept me upright for long enough to complete the final step. I stretched forward to drape the final shoes on a low-hanging branch, shrieking as I felt bone shift against bone, only fragmenting further. It was done, and I could die. I could die now if I had to. The cigarette lit the matches all at once, igniting the shoes. The fire was sluggish initially, but soon spread to a second pair of shoes that I doused in polyurethane spray and stuffed with old mattress foam, both extremely flammable. The flames were, were much more promising from there. The tree abruptly retracted its root from my feet as it attempted to put out the fire, but only succeeded in stoking the growing inferno further. I tumbled backwards, my head striking a rock. A steady flow of blood began to stream from my skull. I observed with manic glee as the flames spread from shoe to shoe, eventually engulfing the old, dried-out branches of the tree. The sounds of blazing wood cracking, creaking, alerted me to move immediately. I momentarily considered getting up to my feet and running, but a quick observation of my mangled foot convinced me otherwise. The bones in my feet were at best splintered and at worst ground to dust. Shards of ivory jutted out of my flesh at all angles. With a great amount of effort, I flipped over and began to drag myself away from the scene on my forearms. I looked back over my shoulder only once to see the tree spewing black smoke as it let out an unearthly bellow. The rest of what happened after that is a bit of a blur, but I remember. I remember. Apparently, I pulled myself down the road. Till some, some travelers in a car took pity on me and stopped to pick me up. I was at the hospital soon after that. Ironically, both my feet had been amputated, so shoes will not be in my future until I recover enough to be fit for prosthetics. I'll go to rehabilitation after I'm released from the hospital. Surprisingly, I haven't seen anything about what I've done in the news yet, but people are still posting angrily about it on social media. If you've lost a loved one in the Pacific Northwest... I implore you to make a daytime visit to one of those shoe trees in Oregon. Browse the multitude of pictures online, check for their shoes while I recover. Because when I'm out of here, I'll burn every last shoe tree down to the ground until shoe throwing is a completely forgotten tradition. Or until I die. Whichever comes first. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to give you a big thank you for watching tonight's video. And I only say video if you guys are watching on YouTube, because otherwise, thank you for subscribing to the podcast that you can get on Spotify, or on Apple's podcasting, or on Google podcasting, or wherever you guys get podcasts. Something I wanted to tell you about tonight before we end tonight's video is the Etsy shop that my wife runs. She runs a mixed tea shop with many different blends, including Creepypasta blends, and it's etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea. And now for patreon.com slash Mr. Creepypasta, which you can always find in the link in the description, I want to give you all a very big thanks. There's many of you down there in the descriptions um, who I give big thanks to, and everybody also at this tier, like Dr. Strawberry, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Ken Lando Higuchi, Brianna Ventine Jensen, Chompinski, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Sandy Barney, Asia, G Weevil 3, Diana Krauss, Stephen Van Huss, Tristan Pelton, Nico Kao, The Ginger Bros, Dante Rao, Rafael Rodriguez, Last Blade Song, Don Mulemeister, Eliminator 86, Nebsky, Steampunk Sinner, Optimistic Avocado, Caleb Dougal, Daniel Polson, Finley, and Sky Harbor. You guys are the MVPs and you guys keep the channel running and I honestly cannot thank you enough for all that you do. That's all for tonight, guys. Sweet dreams.